All right, today I'm going to try to teach you via video what completing the square is. Um, completing the square is another method of solving quadratic equations, but it also is an easy method to convert your quadratic function that's in standard form to vertex form without actually finding the vertex. And the whole idea here is, is that we're trying to make what we call a perfect square. So before we get started, I like to always talk about the idea behind a perfect square, right? So if we're talking about a square, right, that beautiful drawing, um, we're talking about, I know it's a square because all of the side lengths have the same length. So you could say it was a perfect square if the two side lengths were both two, right? Um, two times two gives me an area of two squared, which is four, right? But when we're talking about quadratics, we're talking about making the side lengths be the exact same value. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about the two factors that I could multiply together to do length times width to find area. Um, so for example, if my one side length was X minus two, to be a perfect square, the other side length would have to be the exact same and be X minus two. And what that gives me is what we call perfect square trinomial. So the idea today is how can I turn any standard form um, of quadratic uh, equation into a nice perfect square? So what I end up with is the area of this square looks like that. And what you should notice is this is starting to look sort of like uh, vertex form, which is where we're going with this thing. So multiply length times width. It's a thing that's squared, which is called a perfect square. So we're going to be turning things into perfect squares. Um, the way to start that is, is to talk about perfect square trinomials or standard form quadratic equations that happen to be perfect squares. So if I was going to factor the following trinomials, remember, since our A value is 1, I could always factor this by saying, okay, what factors of 16 also add to 8. Now we've been doing that where we do a times c which is 16 and add to 8 and the factors of 16 that also add to 8 are 4 and 4 and the reason is is 4 times 4 gives me 16 and 4 plus 4 gives me 8. And when I write that out as factors it looks like x plus 4 times x plus 4. I can simplify that to just saying hey look I made this thing a perfect square because both side lengths of this square are the exact same. That's why we're able to just say squared because that's the, two, the same thing multiplied by itself. So these are called perfect square trinomials and the idea is we're trying to get that. So if we're factoring the rest of these, if I look at the one below it, right, I'm trying to see what factors of one add up to two and that should be pretty, pretty easy. It's, it's one, right? One times one gives me one. 1 plus 1 gives me 2, so that would be x plus 1 and x plus 1, which is x plus 1 squared. Cool. Makes sense. All right. If we do these over here, it's the same idea. What factors of 81 add up to 18? What two, sorry, negative 18. What two numbers multiply to give me 81 that also add to give me negative 18? Well, that numbers are negative 9. So this is x minus 9 times x minus 9, which is x minus 9 squared. That's pretty easy, right? And then last but not least, the same thing. Factors of 25 that add to negative 10 are negative 5 and negative 5. So that would be x minus 5 times x minus 5, which gives me x minus 5 squared. Now, what you these are called uh, perfect square trinomials. Um, so if you have a perfect square trinomial, you can solve them by taking the square root. So if I was trying to solve these equations, I would just set them equal to zero because that's finding x-intercepts. And I could solve them by taking the square root of both sides. Even if there was a k value out here to the end, I'd just move it to the other side and take square roots. We saw that yesterday. Okay. One of the most important thing here is, um, that we're going to get to in a little while is to try to figure out where this number came from. All right, so to start off, let's do all of these examples real quick. It says factor the perfect square trinomial, just like we did above, and then I want to solve the equation by taking the square roots, which means set the whole thing equal to zero if it's not equal to anything, and try to figure out what x values will make this thing a nice, uh, perfect, nice perfect value. So let's uh, factor to start with. Uh, um, I'm going to try to take this whole thing right here, which should be a perfect square trinomial right now, and try to see what factors of 4 also add to 2. Uh, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 plus 2 is 4, so that means that this whole thing could be written as 
x plus 2 squared is equal to 25. All right, now just like when we were solving by taking the square root yesterday, um, if I have this little squared guy here and it's isolated on this side, I can take the square root of both sides of this equation to try to solve what makes it equal to zero or find my x-intercepts. Now when I take the square root of this squared thing, I'm just left with what's inside the, uh, underneath the radical, which is x plus 2. And then you've got to remember that when you take the square root of a positive number, you're not only getting the positive root, but you're also getting the negative root. And the square root of 25 is plus or minus 5. So the last step to figure out what my x values would be is I have to subtract 2 from both sides. So I'm looking for what x values make this thing equal to 0. Well, this looks like positive 5 minus 2 and negative 5 minus 2. Is everybody good that I'm using both the positive version and the negative version of 5 and subtracting 2 from it? So positive 5 minus 2 is uh, 3, and negative 5 minus 2 is negative 7. So the two x values that make this equation true, or help me find the x-intercepts, are 3 and negative 7. Here we go. Good to go. All right, let's do one more. Um, I'll leave, uh, I'll leave number two and I'll do number three. So I'll let you do number three, number two and number four. So the first thing we're going to do is try to see if I can factor this perfect square trinomial right here. Um, I'm trying to see what values of 49, what factors of 49 that multiply to 49 and also give me 14. Well, it should be obvious that 49 the square root of 49 is 7, so it's got to be 7. And since this is a negative, when I put them together, they better be negative 7. So this is a perfect square because it would be x minus 7 times x minus 7. And then I'm just going to bring down what it's equal to. And now I have a nice pretty function, which I can solve by taking the square roots of both sides. So if I take the square root of this side and the square root of that side, I'm left with x minus 7 is equal to, uh, the square root of 4 is positive or negative 2. Good. So last step, add 7 to both sides, and my x values, which make this thing true, should look like positive 2 plus 7 and negative 2 plus 7. Positive 2 plus 7 is 9, negative 2 plus 7 is 5, and my two x values, which make this equation true, are 9 and 5. Cool. I'm going to pause it right there, give you a minute um, to do number three, 2 and number 4. All right, let's scroll on down. So now here's where we get to the thing that's called completing the square, and specifically when our a value is 1. So now when you do not have a perfect square trinomial, you can create one by moving some things around, and we call this process completing the square. You follow the steps below to solve the equation by completing the square. So the first step says rewrite your equation as x squared plus bx equals c. And what that means is move, let me write it down, move the constant to the other side. Cool. So the first thing we're going to do is try to take this 7 and we're going to move it to the other side using algebra by subtracting. Now it looks like x squared plus 8x, and then equals negative 7 on the other side. Cool. Now, there's a couple of steps I like to add in here. Personally, I like to put a blank here because what we're trying to do is figure out what value I can put right there that will give me this in the form of a perfect square trinomial like above. <clears throat> and the easiest way for me to do that is to also write the perfect square uh, in vertex form below like this. Okay, so then it says, all right, step two, take half of B. My B term is 8, so I'm going to divide that thing by 2. 8 divided by 2 is 4, and that's what's going to go right there in my equation. The X is going to go down here, and whatever this sign is will be the sign that goes right there, so it's X plus 4, right? That's the first step of that. We'll write it in red, take half of B, and then... What you're going to do after that is you're going to square it. Everybody see square it? 
and put it in that blank next to your equation, right? So 4 squared is 16. That's positive 16. And the last thing it says to do is add that number to both sides. So if I were to add 16 to one side of the equation, I'd also have to add 16 to the other side of the equation. Cool. Now to finish out my factored perfect square trinomial, you'll see how I've already done it here. This is your perfect square trinomial. The number that multiplies to 16 and adds to 8 is 4. I already got that down. But to figure out what goes on the other side of the equation, I just have to put these two numbers together. So negative 7 plus 16 gives me positive 9. And then after that, it's just as simple as solving by taking the square root's last step. Take the square root of both sides and solve for both cases. So you take the square root of this side, take the square root of this side, and I'm left with x. Let's write it up a little bit higher. X plus 4 is equal to uh, square root of 9 is positive or negative 3. Uh, to fi finish this, I need to subtract 4 from both sides. So my X values are going to be positive 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. And they're going to be negative 3 minus 4, which is negative 7. And that's how you solve by completing the square. Now, when we flip over, I'm going to do a couple more examples and let you try. And then I'll do a couple irrational solutions and let you try. But I think the easiest way to do this is, one, move the constants to the other side. Then when you rewrite your equation, go ahead and put a blank on both sides. And then go ahead and write what you want vertex form to look like below it. Then you divide the B value by 2, put it there. Square the B value, put it there in that blank. Also put it in that blank, then add these two numbers together and put it there, and you will have it in vertex form, or at least some form of vertex form. Cool. All right, here we go. All right, step number one for me was move the constant to the other side. I do that by subtracting 27 from both sides. Now, I'm going to rewrite my equation by doing my A term and my B term, and then leaving a blank here. All right, I'm going to make my blank blue so it's obvious where the blanks go. Then I have negative 27 on the other side. And if I'm going to add a blue blank to one side to stay equal by the addition, prop addition property of equality, I'll have to also add to the other side. Cool. Now, before I figure all this out, I'm going to go ahead and fill out what I want vertex form to look like, which is x plus or minus some number squared is equal to some other number. Good. Now, the way you figure out how to what that number is, is you take that b term right there, which is negative 12 and you divide it by 2. Negative 12 divided by 2 is negative 6, and that's what goes in your perfect square factors. And then you take that negative 6, and to get back to the blank, you square it. I'm just going to write SQ to square it. Make sure that when you put negative 6 squared in the calculator, you put it in parentheses, because negative 6 squared is actually 36. This value right here should always be positive because it doesn't matter if you square a negative number, it'll always be positive. Now, the last step is, okay, I put it in the blank on this side. Also, have to put it in the blank on that side and then add these two numbers together. Negative 27 plus 36 gives me 9. So now all I've got to do to finish is solve the equation. To solve the equation when it looks like this or it's uh, perfect squares, I can just take square roots, so take the square root of this side, take the square root of this side, I'm left with x minus 6 is equal to plus or minus 3, add 6 to both sides, and x better be equal to either positive 3 plus 6, which is 9, or negative 3 plus 6, which is 3. And I'm done. Coolio, good to go. I'll do one more for you and let you do uh, seven and eight. I'll do number six this time. All right. First step, move the constant to the other side. I'm going to do that by adding five to both sides. And then I'm going to read my, my equation, my A term and my B term. And then I'm going to also put a blank for what I want my C term to be to be a perfect square. Then I have the five, the constant I move to the other side, and then also put the blank that I had over there. I'm going to go ahead and fill in what I want my equation to look like when I finish completing the square. And then to do it, all I have to do is take my B term, divide it by 2. It's what's going to go right there. Positive 4 divided by 2 is positive 2. And then take that positive 2 and square it to figure out what goes in my blank. And 2 squared is 4. 
make sure that now that I put the four in that blank, I added it to one side, I also have to add it to the other. And the last step would be add these two numbers together, which again, I don't know why this keeps working out to nine, but hey, lucky us. Now to solve, because the whole point of this is solving, I'm going to take the square roots of both sides. The square root of x plus 2 squared is just x plus 2. The square root of 9 is positive or negative 3. Subtract 2 from both sides. And your x values that are solutions or x-intercepts to this equation are going to be positive 3 minus 2, which is 1, or negative 3 minus 2, which is negative 5. Now I'm going to give you, I would go ahead and pause the video and y'all work together and try to do number seven and number eight. And when you pause it, start it back again, uh, we'll do the ones at the. All right. Hopefully that was enough time to um, complete seven and eight. If you have any questions, just look at the key and I'll help you when I get back on Monday. Same thing works for if you have irrational solutions. And remember, irrational solutions, mostly you're talking about numbers that are decimals, that are non-repeating and, and non-terminating, or really, more importantly, they're square roots of non-perfect squares, right? So things like square root of 242, like that's not a perfect square, so it's irrational. Cool. Um, and we can have answers like that. In fact, it happens quite often. So Here's what it's going to look like when you solve each complete each equation by completing the square, um, and you just end up with irrational solutions. So we're just going through the exact same steps. Move your constant to the other side by adding it over there. I'll rewrite my equation so that I have a blank for the c value that I'm going to try to figure out to make this thing a perfect square trinomial. I've got my 4 over there, so I better also have the blank that I'm going to add to the other side. Then I'm going to go ahead and rewrite what I want my equation to look like when I turn it into a perfect square. And then to figure out what goes in that equation, you take the b value and divide it by 2. That's negative 2 divided by 2 gives me negative 1. And then to figure out what goes in the blank, you just square it. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. Once I get what goes in the blue blank, I put it on both sides, add that 1 to the other side. And I can add these two numbers up to figure out what goes on the right side of my equation, which has to be 5. Now, to solve, right, I've got to continue trying to get x by itself. And the way we do that when it's in this nice form is I can take the square root of it because it kind of is in vertex form, right? And the square root of x minus 1 is just x minus 1. And the square root of 5 is just the square root of 5, except I need the positive square root of 5 and the negative square root of 5. And that's pretty much it. The last step would just be add 1 to both sides. So the x values that are going to make this equation true, right, are 1 plus or minus the square root of 5. And what you should notice is that's two different values. If you want to write them separately, oh, Let's move this out of the way, and I'll write them separately in, in red over here. If you want to write the two x values separately, they would look like, okay, x could be 1 plus the square root of 5, and x could also be 1 minus the square root of 5. But putting those that plus or minus in there is telling me that those are the two roots, and I can just leave it like that. We don't want to do decimal approximations. We want to give exact answers. Cool, yeah. Good to go. I'll do number 10 with you and let you do number 11 and 12, and we will be done. Completing the square, solved by completing the square, first step, move your constants to the other side. Then rewrite your equation and make sure you leave a blank for the value that you're going to put in to complete the square. I've got negative 46 on the other side and I better also have that same blank over there too. When I'm completing this, I'm turning it into a perfect square, which is attempting to try to make both sides of the triangle the same. And the way you do that is you take half of your B value, which is 16, half of that is positive 8, and you square it, and you put it in that blue blank, and 8 squared is 64. Once I add 64 to one side, I also have to add 64 to the other side. And now all I have to do to figure out what's on the right side of my equal sign is to add those two things up. Negative 46 plus 64 gives me 18. Oh, let's write it in red or black. Good. And now all I have to do is take the square root of both sides of the equation. 
the square root of x plus 8 squared is just x plus 8. Oh, let's do the black. x plus 8. And the square root of 18 is just the square root of 18, but you have to remember that you should always try to simplify this. Okay, you can simplify it by typing it into a calculator. The square root of 18, uh, if you wanted to simplify it by hand, would look like this. It's the same thing as the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. And the square root of 9 is 3. So square root of 18 is really 3 times the square root of 2. But don't forget, you're taking the square root of a positive number, which means you need both the positive and the negative square root. Last step, subtract 8 from both sides. And your x values that make this equation true are going to be negative 8 plus or minus 3 times the square root of 2. Good. That's two different things. It's negative 8 plus 3 times the square root of 2 and negative 8 minus 3 times the square root of 2. And that's the two points where that graph will cross the x-axis. Now go ahead and take some time to do 11 and 12. And when you finish with that, you should be trying to complete uh, the completing the square maze, which is just finding the C value that makes that uh, a perfect square trinomial, which is dividing B by 2 and uh, squaring it. That should be enough to get you through your delta math. Two, if you have any questions, you can either email me or check the keys online at Canvas.